Learn English through stories of two. Adapted and modified by. Kolwant Singh Sandhu. Contents. 1. Going home. 2. Grammar page. 1. Going home. By Ruskin Bond. The train came panting through the forest and into the flat brown plain. The engine whistled piercingly and a few cows moved off the track. In a swaying third-class compartment, two men played cards. A woman held a baby to an exposed breast. A Sikh laborer, wearing brief pants, lay asleep on an upper bunk, snoring fitfully. An elderly, unshaven man chewed the last of his pan and spat the red juice out of the window. A small boy, mischief in his eyes, jingled a bag of coins in front of an anxious farmer. Oh. Jingle bells, jingle bells. Jingle all the way. Fun, fun, train shuck shuck. Goes on the railway. Day Aram, the farmer, was going home, home to his rice fields, his buffalo and his wife. His brother had died recently, and Dea Ram had taken the ashes to hard war to immerse them in the holy waters of the Ganga, and now he was on the train to Dehradun and soon he would be home. He was looking concerned, because he had just remembered his wife's admonition about being careful with money. Ten rupees was what he had left with him and it was all in the bag the boy held. Let me have it now, said Dea Ram before the money falls out. He made a grab at the little bag that contained his coins, notes, and railway ticket, but the boy shrieked with delight and leapt out of the way. Dea Ram stroked his mustache. It was a long drooping mustache that contributed a certain sadness to his somewhat kind and foolish face. He reflected that it was his own fault for having started the game. The child had been down in the mouth, sullen and gloomy. To cheer him up, Dea Ram had begun jingling his money. Now the boy was jingling the money right in front of the open window. Come now, give it back, pleaded Dea Ram, or I shall tell your mother. The boy's mother had her back to them, and it was a large back, almost as forbidding as her front. But the boy was enjoying his game and would not give up the bag. He was exploiting to the full Dea Ram's easygoing, tolerant nature, and kept bobbing up and down on the seat, waving the bag in the poor man's face. Suddenly the boy's mother, who had been engrossed in conversation with another woman, turned and saw what was happening. She walloped the boy over the head, and the suddenness of the blow, it was more of a thump than a slap, made him fall back against the window, and the cloth bag fell from his hand onto the railway embankment outside. Now Dea Ram's first impulse was to leap out of the moving train. But when someone shouted, pull the alarm cord, he decided on this course of action. He plunged for the alarm cord, but just at the moment someone else shouted, don't pull the cord, and Dea Ram, who usually listened to others, stood in suspended animation, waiting for further directions. Too many people are stopping trains every day all over India, said one of the card players, who wore large thick-rimmed spectacles over a pair of tiny humorless eyes, and was obviously a post office counter clerk. You people are becoming a menace to the railways. Exactly, said the other card player. You stop the train on the most trifling excuses. What is your trouble? My money has fallen out, said Dea Ram. Why didn't you say so, exclaimed the clerk, jumping up. Stop the train. Sit down, said his companion. It's too late now. The train cannot wait here until he walks half a mile back down the line. How much did you lose? He asked Dea Ram. Ten rupees. And you have no more? Dea Ram shook his head. Then you had better leave the train at the next station and go back for it. The next station, Harola, was about ten miles from the spot where the money had fallen. Dea Ram got down from the train and started back along the railway track. He was a well built man, with strong legs and a dark, burnished skin. He wore a vest and dhoti, and had a red cloth tied round his head. He walked with long, easy steps, but the ground had been scorched by the burning sun, and it was not long before his feet were hurting. 
His eyes, too, were unaccustomed to the glare of the plains, and he held a hand up over them or looked at the ground. The sun was high in the sky, beating down on his bare arms and legs. Soon his body was running with sweat, his vest was soaked through and sticking to his skin. There were no trees anywhere near the railway lines, which ran straight to the hazy blue horizon. There were fields in the distance and cows grazed on short grass, but there were no humans in sight. After an hour's walk, Deir Ram felt thirsty, his tongue was furred, his gums dry, his lips like parchment. When he saw a buffalo wallowing in a muddy pool, he hurried to the spot and drank thirstily of the stagnant water. Still, his pace did not slacken. He knew of only one way to walk, and that was at this steady long pace. At the end of another hour he felt sure he had passed the place where the bag had fallen. He had been inspecting the embankment very closely, and now he felt discouraged and dispirited. But still he walked on. He was worried more by the thought of his wife's attitude than by the loss of the money or the problem of the next meal. Rather than turn back, he continued walking until he reached the next station. He kept following the lines and after half an hour dragged his aching feet onto Raywala platform. To his surprise and joy, he saw a note in Hindi on the notice board. Anyone having lost a bag containing some notes and coins may inquire at the station master's office. Some honest man or woman or child had found the bag and handed it in. Deir Ram felt that his faith in the goodness of human nature had been justified. He rushed into the office and pushing aside an indignant clerk exclaimed, You have found my money. What money snapped the harassed looking official and don't just charge in here shouting at the top of your voice, this is not a hotel. The money I lost on the train said Deir Ram. Ten rupees. In notes or in coins, asked the station master, who was not slow in assessing a situation. Six one rupee notes said Deir Ram. The rest is in coins. Mm. And what was the purse like? White cloth said Deir Ram. Dirty white cloth, he added for clarification. The official put his hand in a drawer, took out the bag, and flung it across the desk. Without further parley, Deir Ram scooped up the bag and burst through the swing doors completely revived after his fatiguing march. Now he had only one idea, to celebrate, in his small way, the recovery of his money. So he left the station and made his way through a sleepy little bazaar to the nearest tea shop. He sat down at a table and asked for tea in a hookah. The shopkeeper placed a record on a gramophone, and the shrill music shattered the afternoon silence of the bazaar. A young man sitting idly at the next table smiled at Deir Ram and said, You are looking happy as pleased as Punch, brother. Deir Ram beamed. I lost my money and found it, he said simply. Then you should celebrate with something stronger than tea, said the friendly stranger with a wink. Come on into the next room. He took Deir Ram by the arm and was so comradely that the older man felt pleased and flattered. They went behind a screen, and the shopkeeper brought them two glasses and a bottle of country-made rum. Before long, Deir Ram had told his companion the story of his life. He had also paid for the rum and was prepared to pay for more. But two of the young man's friends came in and suggested a card game and Deir Ram, who remembered having once played a game of cards in his youth, showed enthusiasm. He lost sportingly, to the tune of five rupees. The rum had such a benevolent effect on his already genial nature that he was quite ready to go on playing until he had lost everything, but the shopkeeper came in hurriedly with the information that a policeman was hanging about outside. Deir Ram's table companions promptly disappeared. Deir Ram was still happy. He paid for the hookah and the cup of tea he hadn't had and went lurching into the street. He had some vague intention of returning to the station to catch a train and had his ticket in his hand. By now his sense of direction was so confused that he turned down a side alley and was soon lost in a labyrinth of tiny alleyways. Just when he thought he saw trees ahead, his attention was drawn to a man leaning against a wall and groaning wretchedly. The man was in rags, his hair was tousled and his face looked bruised. Deir Ram heard his groans and stumbled over to him. What is wrong? he asked with concern. 
What is the matter with you? I've been robbed, said the man, speaking with difficulty. Two thugs beat me and took my money. Don't go any further this way. Can I do anything for you, said Dayer Ram. Where do you live? No, I will be all right, said the man, leaning heavily on Dayer Ram. Just help me to the corner of the road, and then I can find my way. Do you need anything, said Dayer Ram. Do you need any money? No, no, just help me to those steps. Dayer Ram put an arm around the man and helped him across the road, seating him on a step. Are you sure I can do nothing for you, persisted Dayer Ram. The man shook his head and closed his eyes, leaning back against the wall. Dayer Ram hesitated a little and then left. But as soon as Dayer Ram turned the corner, the man opened his eyes. He transferred the bag of money from the fold of his shirt to the string of his pajamas. Then, completely recovered, he was up and away. Dayer Ram discovered his loss when he had gone about 50 yards, and then it was too late. He was puzzled, but was not upset. So many things had happened to him today, and he was confused and unaware of his real situation. He still had his ticket, and that was what mattered most. The train was at the station, and Dayer Ram got into a half-empty compartment. It was only when the train began to move that he came to his senses and realized what had befallen him. As the engine gathered speed, his thoughts came faster. He was not worried, except by the thought of his wife, and he was not unhappy, but he was puzzled. He was not angry or resentful, but he was a little hurt. He knew he had been tricked, but he couldn't understand why. He had really liked those people he had met in the tea shop of Raywala, and he still could not bring himself to believe that the man in rags had been putting on an act. Have you got a beady? asked a man beside him, who looked like another farmer. Dayer Ram had a beady. He gave it to the other man and lit it for him. Soon they were talking about crops and rainfall and their respective families, and although a faint uneasiness still hovered at the back of his mind, Dayer Ram had almost forgotten the day's misfortunes. He had his ticket to Dehradun and from there, he had to walk only three miles, and then he would be home, and there would be hot milk and cooked vegetables waiting for him. He and the other farmer chattered away, as the train went panting across the wide brown plain. Vocabulary Admonition, warning Forbidding, threatening Exploiting, misusing Impulse, sudden strong wish Furred, covered with white stuff Parchment, dry skin of animals used for writing in the olden days Parley, discussion Punch, alcoholic drink with fruits Promptly, quickly. 2. Grammar page.